Good evening, church. How are we? Cool. Well, hey, uh, we, we, we show uh, little bumper videos like that to try to get your mind around some things. Um, um, here's, here's what we'll say. We, we show things like that to try to start to get your mind around things like this. Um, if you are going to call yourself a follower of Jesus, and my assumption is not that everyone in the room would call themselves a follower of Jesus. Uh, my assumption is that there are some of you who do and some of you who don't. But, but for those of you that do, one of the things I want to challenge you to think about tonight is if we are going to call ourselves followers of Jesus, that plays out not just when we're here at church, but in every moment of our day and in every conceivable place that we go, including the grocery store parking lot. And if you've not been with us for a few weeks, what we've tried to do is this. Um, we have tried to, for the last five weeks, and we'll continue to do it this week and next, talk about what it means to live and love like Jesus in our everyday relationships. Saying that the most important thing about our Christian faith isn't what we do on Sundays. It's not that we know the songs or know the Bible verses. It's not that we have religious knowledge. The important thing about our faith is how that translates in the way we love people, in the way we talk to people, in the way we engage with others. And so we're going to continue continue with that tonight. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, you want to open up to Matthew chapter 20. Um, lighting, guys, can we turn off the hazer and bring up the lights a little bit? Thank you. Um, so we will do that. Uh, if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 20. Before I jump in tonight, I do uh, want to give you a brief update. Most of you uh, do not need to be updated, but for those of you that don't, I don't assume all of you know me. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Brian Howard. I'm the high school pastor, and I have the amazing news to report um, that last week I had my first child. Um, so we're amazed. Yeah. Yeah, we can show up. Show her up, yeah. Isn't she awesome? It's amazing. Um, so Grace, Grace Kelly Howard. Um, Grace Kelly Howard brought into the world on Wednesday, uh, October 4th uh, at 10.55 uh, p.m. Um, she came into the world and... Um, Man, just praise God, um, her, her mother, uh, my wife, Danny, is, is healthy, uh, that the baby is healthy. We had some concerns throughout the pregnancy, some of you know this, uh, about her heart, um, that there were going to be some problems. I shared this at summer camp. Um, many of you heard me talk about we were nervous about her heart. There were some things going on. Uh, she was born. She had some checkups right away and just nothing at all wrong with her heart. So we're just praising God for a healthy baby, a really amazing, amazing thing. And so um, uh, my wife and I, for the last week, have just gotten to explore this new part of our lives, this new journey we're on called being parents. And, and let me tell you something, it's new, it's fresh, it's different, it's never something we've done before. Um, and, and really, I've been thinking about, okay, how do I describe this first kind of week to you guys as I just kind of do this journey of life and following Jesus with you all? Um, and, and the best picture, um, maybe you've seen pictures like it, but I want to show you this picture. It kind of describes my last, you know, 11 days. Um, so this is us in the hospital. Two, two things about this picture. The first is this. We were at the hospital um, for a couple of days as, as she was coming into this world, um, and every day, every meal, they'd feed us hospital food, which is only a little bit better than cardboard. Um, and, and you're eating hospital food, and so people would call or text and say, hey, we'd love to come see the baby. Can we bring you food? And every time we said, yes, would you bring us Chick-fil-A? And so people did, and so you'll, every picture from the hospital, you'll see a little Chick-fil-A cup. We're thinking of having Chick-fil-A sponsor our child, like Grace Kelly Howard, brought to you by Chick-fil-A. We just thought that would be a great, so that has nothing to do with the sermon at all. Um, but here's what does. Here's why I show you this picture. This picture perfectly captures for me what the last 11 days of my life have been like. Um, the first is, you'll see this big old smile on my face. I have been so happy. Um, it has been amazing. Um, I just sit there and stare at this girl. Someone said, every social media post your wife puts up, you're just staring at her. I'm like, yes, that's all I do. Um, I don't sleep. I don't eat. I don't do anything else. I just stare at this girl because she's so amazing. Uh, really, just no, uh, no explanation for it. Nothing I can get my mind around. Nothing I could have even been prepared for. Um, so happy happy. And at the same time, you'll notice very clearly in this picture, I am sleeping um, because the last 11 days have been exhausting. Um, this girl has this great internal clock where she sleeps all day and screams all night. Um, that is what she does. And so have I slept much? No. Um, when I plan to sleep, I'm like, oh, I'll go take a nap. She's like, no, no, no. Um, and then <laughs> that's where I am. So I'm exhausted right now. So here's just, I'll ask for some grace tonight. Um, if I say something and it comes out of my mouth, you're like, I'm fairly certain that's not a Christian thing to say. Um, just give me some grace on that, okay? Very good, very good. Well, we'll jump into, <laughs> we'll try our best. So, um, I didn't even mean to make that pun, see, I'm tired. <laughs> but here's what I mean. What I want to try to point out to you tonight is this. Um, 
Tonight we began watching that little video of just trying to figure out, what, should I serve this person, should I love this person? We're just kind of seeing that play out. And, and here's what I've been thinking about, even in this moment, that I've been utterly exhausted, and at the same time, I'm just filled with joy. Here's what I've noticed, and maybe you've noticed the same thing is true of your life. The moments where you find the most joy in life, like the most profound, deep kind of I am satisfied about life, are usually also connected with the moments where you are most physically exhausted. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I've noticed that to be true, that this moment where I'm just completely exhausted taking care of my daughter and this complete, deep, kind of unexplainable joy seem to be connected with me. And maybe, that obviously, that's not true for for any of you when it comes to having a kid, but maybe it's true when it comes to that sport you play. Right, like you've been absolutely exhausted in practices and working out and doing all of that, and yet there's this deep joy attached to it. Or if you've ever been in a musical or a play, some kind of production, you know what it's like even a dance production where you're just exhausted as you're practicing for it and getting ready, and yet somehow it brings this kind of deep joy. So that my observation would be this, it's true for all of us, that that we seem to experience that it's the moments where we're most overwhelmed, exhausted, stretched out of our comfort zone, where we experience even a level of pain and suffering, that there's the deepest joy attached to it. And what I want to try to point out tonight, what I hope you see so clearly this evening, is that our deepest pain and suffering, our struggle, when we're stretched out of our comfort zone, that tends to be the thing that pushes us into the most joy and to the most delight, to the most satisfaction in this life. And that's what I hope you're able to see. Even if you're here tonight and you're not a believer, you're not a Christian, you're just checking this thing out, I hope you can see this about Jesus because Jesus teaches this so clearly in the text we're going to tonight. Here's where he begins. Matthew chapter 20 um, starts in verse 20. It says this. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down, asking a favor. So Zebedee's sons are just two of the disciples. There was 12 of them. These 12 disciples that followed Jesus, it said, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. Verse 21, what is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons might sit at your right hand and that the other at your left hand in your kingdom. So if you've been around here a few weeks, one of the things we've been pointing out is that Jesus said to his followers, I'm going to set up a kingdom that's going to last forever. And most of his followers, when they heard that, thought he meant, we're going to fight a revolution against the Roman Empire, we're going to topple the Roman Empire, and we're going to be in charge of the world. And so this is what they were under the impression of. And so these two disciples, their mom comes in and asks a question about that kingdom. So when you guys topple Rome and you're in charge of everything, can my son sit at your left hand and right hand? And now here's what we don't have in the text. We don't have whether or not the sons actually wanted their mom to do that. Like, don't raise your hand, but I wonder if any of you have ever had a moment where your mother has embarrassed you by asking a question you didn't want your mom to ask. Like, this is kind of this tense, awkward moment. Mama walks up with the sons like, I'd like my children to be special. Like, that's what happens here. And I want you to see Jesus' response. Because I think Jesus' response will help you understand deeply what it means to be a follower of Christ, what it means to be a Christian. Here's what it says here. Um, Jesus responds, verse 22. He says, you don't know what you're asking. And, And we'll move on with his response in just a moment, but it's actually one of the most beautiful responses Jesus ever gives to anyone. He says, you don't even know what you're asking for which I find profoundly comforting at times because I don't know about you, but there have been times I've asked God for things and he said no. There have been times I've wanted God to do something and he hasn't done it. There have been times I've wanted God to move in a way in my life and he's chosen to do something opposite. And I get frustrated and I get angry because I want my way. And I wonder if there have been times where the God of the universe has looked down at Brian Howard and all of his frailness and weakness and gone, Brian, you don't even know what you're asking for. You don't even know what saying yes to that would bring into your life, the kind of damage, the kind of pain, the kind of suffering you would have to go through. I wonder if sometimes God listens to your requests and mine and goes, that's nice, but you have no idea what that would mean. You have no idea what you're asking for. It's a comfort to me to know that God does know what we're asking, even when I think I'm right. Even when I think if I ask for this thing, this is definitely what God should do. It is a comfort to me to know that God is above my small requests. So he continues on this way. You don't even know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm about to drink? We can, they answered. So... Jesus is going to tap into a metaphor here, and it's a metaphor that's all over the Bible. Whether you grew up in church or not, maybe you're not really clear how this metaphor works, but all over the Bible there's the idea that God gives us cups. He gives us cups. And they're not literal cups, it's the idea that he gives you a cup, and what you drink out of that cup is his destiny for you, it's his desire for you, it's his will for you. 
And so all over the Bible, we see things about cups. Maybe if you grew up in church or just even heard of it, Psalm 23 says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. There's cups of God's joy. There's cups of God's anger. There's cups of God's blessing. There's cups of God's triumph. The idea of a cup was something you drank, and that was your destiny. It's what God had for you. It was an image. It was a metaphor. And while there are all these different cups throughout the Bible, really you can break them down into two categories, two types of cups. The first one is this. The first is the cup of victory. It's the cup of God's victory and of his triumph. It's of his blessing and of his goodness. Maybe you're looking at this saying, that's not a cup, it's a candle holder. It's close enough. (laughs) But that's what that is. In the Bible, there's a cup, and it's the cup of God's joy. It's the cup of God's blessing. It's of his goodness. Will you have this cup? You drink this cup. When things are going well, when things have been blessed, your life is overwhelmed with God's goodness and provision for you. There is a cup in the Bible of victory and of joy and of blessing and of triumph and of resurrection. This is one of the cups. But then there's a second cup. Like all throughout the Bible, there are these amazing cups where God has given me my cup, my portion. He's so taken care of me and blessed me. But then there's a simpler and a more plain and a more average cup. And that's the cup of God's pain, of suffering, of discomfort. It's the cup we drink when things aren't going so well, at least in our minds, when things aren't the way we want them to be, where we're stretched outside of our comfort zone, where we're dealing with things we never thought we'd have to deal with, where we're dealing with pain that we never even imagined would be pain we'd have to deal with. See, there are different kinds of cups in the Bible, and some of them are cups of victory and blessing and God's goodness and his power and and his triumph. And some of them are cups of God's pain and his suffering, cups where God gives us things that seem difficult in that moment, but God has given it to us. It's his portion. It's his will. It's his destiny for us to absorb that now. And here's what happens in this. Jesus says, you don't even know what you're asking can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? And they say, we can. See, here's what's happening. Don't miss this. In that moment, Jesus is saying, you're not able to drink this cup. And they're going, yes, we can. Because they think Jesus is talking about this cup. They think Jesus is talking about the fact that we're going to go take over the world and we're going to raise the cup of victory and triumph and we're going to drink from it because God has blessed us and we have won. They think that Jesus is talking about this cup. When in fact, Jesus is talking about this one. They think Jesus is talking about triumph and victory and resurrection of God's power and his goodness and his might and his wealth and his riches. And what Jesus is actually talking about is the cup of pain and the cup of suffering. Because here's what happens with Jesus. We're later going to learn that that same Jesus who says this to them, that you can't drink that cup, drinks the cup. And maybe the best way to describe it is this, that Hebrews chapter 12 says this, that says that Jesus, for the joy set before him, meaning Jesus saw this cup, this cup right here that was filled with joy and goodness and blessing and power. It says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. In other words, so that Jesus could get to this cup, Jesus endured this one. So that Jesus could get up to blessing and goodness and triumph and resurrection and God's glory, he went through the cup of God's suffering. Where Jesus Christ on the cross drinks in the suffering for all of our sin, for all of our wickedness and rebellion against God. God says to his son, Jesus, here, you drink this cup. You suffer for the sins of all of the people who would call upon my name so that, Jesus, you might move to a place where you are seated at the right hand of the throne of God. There are two different kinds of cups in the Bible. And Jesus' disciples think he's talking about this one. And he goes, no, 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 no. I'm talking about this cup. And you, are you really going to be able to drink this cup? And they say, yes, we are. And then I love Jesus' response. If you're kind of confused, I think you'll see it better here. It says, in verse 23, it says, Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant these places belong for those, those for whom my, they have been prepared by my Father. Jesus is saying, listen, if my path is to drink the cup of suffering on my way to the cup of glory, those who follow me are going to have to drink from the cup of suffering on the way to the cup of glory. Hear that clearly. 
Jesus' path was one of pain and suffering and death and agony that led him to an ultimate glory. And if you want to call yourself a follower of Jesus, it's going to mean you drinking the cup that God has put before you, which oftentimes will mean pain, it'll mean suffering, it'll mean agony, it'll mean discomfort, so that God might lead you to a place of victory and triumph and blessing and resurrection. Let me explain what I mean by this. Um, So, Tonight, I want to talk to you about what it means to be someone who serves. Uh, We use this metaphor, you'll see it up there, of foot washers. There's this great scene in the Bible where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He shows them he's a servant. It means that Jesus was someone who served. And when we talk about serving, there's two different ways I could go about it. The first is to say this. The first would be for us to have a bunch of sign-up sheets and to be like, all right, guys, we're going to go to a soup kitchen this fall, and then we're going to go serve in the special needs ministry, and then we're going to serve the babies, and then we're going to go clean up the streets and help some little old lady. We're going to do all of these programs. That's one way of doing it. And I'll say this. It's a good way of doing it. There are good ministries you can be a part of in this church. Actually, just let me, by a show of hands, let me ask this. Um, who here on a regular basis, let's say at least once a month, volunteers with some other ministry than high school ministry somewhere in this church? Just by show of hands. That's awesome. We love that. We think that matters. We think one of the most important things for you to do is to plug in and to be a part of something. But I want to be clear tonight. I'm not talking about trying to get you to sign up for some kind of program around here. I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about you being the type of person that says whatever God puts in front of me in this moment, I will drink that cup because God is God and I am not. I will absorb whatever Jesus has for me because I know on the way to God's blessing and his goodness and his power and his resurrection, there is a different cup that Jesus will set before me. And he says to his disciples, you will drink from this cup. So so let me give you some examples on how that might play out in your life. Um, When I was a senior in high school, many of you know this, I've shared it before. Um, My youth pastor left. Um, There was no one in the church kind of leading it. Uh, And so during that time, it was kind of this awkward time where we kind of had to just kind of run things on our own. And in the process of that, I wanted the experience of my senior year. I wanted to be a senior in high school who was growing in the Lord and who grew in my faith and grew in my ministry. And all of this, I wanted high school ministry to be awesome at my church. But here's the cup that Jesus put in front of me. Jesus said, right now I need you to love and serve people who are younger than you. I was 17 years old. I was a senior in high school. And Jesus asked me to love freshmen and sophomores and juniors. People who are younger than me. People who weren't like me. People who didn't go to my school. It wasn't a pleasant experience. It wasn't an easy experience. But what Jesus was asking me to do was, listen, I want you to serve people who have nothing to offer you back. I want you to be the one, because you're older and you have a car, who pick them up and bring them to youth group. I want you to be the one who goes to In-N-Out and they don't have jobs and they're broken, so you're buying them. What Jesus asked me to do in that season was to serve people who were younger than I was. That was the cup he put in front of me. It wasn't a program. It wasn't something I volunteered for once a week. It was Jesus saying, in this season of your life, serve people who are younger. Fast forward to the summer of 2010, I graduate college, I came on staff here as an intern. I'm an intern for the high school uh, ministry, I'm 21 years old, I come on staff, and here's what I thought would happen. I thought I would come on staff at this great church called Calvary, and I would just love it, and everyone would be like, Brian's awesome, and I'd be like, yes I am, I'm amazing, and I would drink from the cup of God's blessing and his goodness, and people would be like, yeah, you're wonderful, and I thought it would be that. But here's what happened. I get here my first day, and my boss says, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go down to the storage closet. I was like, yeah? And he goes, and you're going to clean it. I was like, what? That's what I'm going to do? I thought ministry was like this cool, like you're standing in front of hundreds of people sharing the gospel. He's like, no, 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 you will. But right now you need to clean that closet. Why? Because that was the cup that Jesus put in front of me in that season. And so I spent a summer cleaning out coolers and sweeping closets and vacuuming out vans and doing all of this nitty-gritty behind-the-scenes work because that's the cup that Jesus put in front of me then. Fast forward a couple years, now I'm the high school pastor. Now I think for sure it's just glory and awesomeness, and everyone's going to look at me and be like, high school pastor is great, and I'll be like, victory is mine, and everyone's going to be wonderful and kind. And listen, there's been some amazing things, but you know what? Jesus has asked me in this season as the high school pastor to deal with some real difficulty some real pain and suffering. 
Like some of you are, are doing okay in life. Some of your lives are falling apart. And some of you have sat with me and others on our team and have walked through incredible suffering together because that's the cup Jesus has put in front of me now. And ultimately, Jesus is saying, if you want to experience my power and my goodness and my blessing over your life, you're going to have to drink from this cup first. You don't get to sidestep it. You don't get to move around it. It's the spring of 2013. I make a decision and I make a commitment and a covenant before the Lord and and before this church that I'm going to marry Danny. And I do that. And again, I think marriage is just going to be victory and amazingness and joy and awesomeness all the time. And hear me. There's some amazing things about marriage. It's my best friend. We live together. It's amazing. There's other things you get to do. It's pretty spectacular, right? This is what I think. Someone just got it. They're like, oh. (laughs) But hear me. Hear me on this. My assumption that this was going to be marriage, it was going to just be joy and victory and triumph and wonderful and everything's awesome. What I quickly realized was this, that God had a different cup in front of me. He said, Brian, if you want to experience the joy and the blessing of marriage, you're going to have to do the dishes. You're going to have to take out the trash. You're going to have to love and serve your wife even when it's difficult and even when it's hard and even when you're exhausted because that's the cup I put in front of you now. And then 11 days ago, my daughter comes into this world, and listen, there are so many amazing, incredible things, and I feel like, yes, victory, we have this beautiful, amazing child, and it is beautiful, but you know what God said? He said, you know what, Brian, in this season, you're going to change diapers. You're going to wake up in the middle of the night when you'd rather be sleeping, and you're going to love your daughter. Like, no joke, I'll just be really transparent with you. Um, I didn't sleep well last night. I came and preached this morning at the 11 a.m. service, and I was exhausted. I had a number of people look at me and be like, you don't look so good, which is always, like, super encouraging when you already feel awful. They're like, you look terrible. I'm like, now I feel terrible. (laughs) So I went home this afternoon, and my wife and I were like, okay, what's going to happen? Baby's sleeping. Baby's okay. Um, Brian's going to take, like, a two-hour nap, and then he's going to come back to church, and he's going to be good. And everything seemed good with that until baby stopped sleeping. And baby started screaming. And it wasn't like, oh, calm down. It was like a two-hour scream fest, uh, a baby not feeling so good. See, see, what I wanted was everything to be beautiful and wonderful. But what Jesus said this afternoon, like three hours ago was, here's your cup. Are you going to serve your baby? Are you going to serve your child? And here's my question for you right now. What's the cup Jesus has put in front of you right now? What's the person, the situation, the the thing you're dealing with, the thing you're walking through, that person in your life that Jesus has put in front of you, and everything in us wants to avoid it, right? Like everything in us wants to say, that's awkward, that's uncomfortable, that's painful, and so I'll just kind of avoid the painful stuff and enjoy God's blessing and his goodness and his glory. But here's what Jesus is saying. If you want to follow me, you will indeed drink from this cup. Who's that person? What's that situation? Uh, like, I don't know if it's a brother or a sister, and it seems like they're so demanding and so frustrating and it's so difficult because your whole family seems to bend around them right now. And it's so annoying and it's so difficult. And you'd rather just have a family where everything was great all the time and everything's wonderful. But here's what Jesus has said. This is your cup in this season. Love your little brother. Love your little sister. Help out with that family member, that grandma or grandpa who's staying with you because they're sick and it's really difficult and you'd really rather have them not around. This is the cup that I put in front of you. Now drink it. I wonder if any of you have a friend. Like you have that friend and it's what that kind of friend where everything seems to be about them, right? You ever had a friend like this? Where, don't point. Uh, but you ever had a friend like this where it's like every time you talk to them, they want to talk about their problems and you end up talking about their problems and they never actually ask you how you're doing. You're actually confused. You're like, do you even know who I am? Like you don't know any. Here's the deal. Here's what I wonder some of you have to know. That's the cup Jesus put in front of you right now. It's not pleasant. It's not easy. Let me tell you, there's nothing fun about a friendship where all they care about is themselves and their story and they just want from you and give you nothing in return. But if that's the cup Jesus has put in front of you, I'm going to promise you, you don't get to the glory of good friendships if you don't work through seasons where friendships are difficult. Let me expand that a little bit. I think some of you joined a small group this fall. Or maybe, yeah, yeah. Or maybe some of you rejoined a small group. But hear me. Here's our assumption about small group. Our assumption about small group is it's just going to be wonderful all the time. 
Like we'll get together, we'll read the Bible, we'll pray, we'll cry together. It'll be just like at camp. Every moment will just be completely transparent and amazing. We will drink from the cup of God's blessing and his victory and his goodness. And then you actually join a small group. And you realize that some of the people in the group are really annoying. Right? Like you realize that some of the people in the group don't show up all the time. And sometimes they come and they have problems that you're sick of hearing about. Sometimes they come into the room and you just struggle with their personality and they grate on you and you're just frustrated and angry. And here's what I want to tell you. If you want to experience the blessing of a true small group that really works and that's really beautiful and spectacular and amazing of God's blessing and his goodness, you're going to have to walk through a season where things are difficult, where things are hard, because that's the cup Jesus has put in front of you now. And the tragedy for so many of our small groups is that some of you get into a group, you realize it's kind of hard and it's not always easy the way you thought it would be, so you bail. And some of you do that on small groups, some of you do that with friendships, some of you do that with your family, some of you do that with a person at school or on your team. And my question for you now is this, who's that person, what's that situation that God has put in front of you now, what's the cup that Jesus says you will drink from this if you want to move on to my blessing, my power, my resurrection, my goodness, who's that person right now? You see, here's how the story continues. Jesus tells them, you'll, you'll definitely drink from my cup. And then in verse 24, it says, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers and the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying that there are rulers, there are powerful people, there are rich people that seem to do everything they can to avoid suffering and messy people and just enjoy the blessing and the riches and the goodness. There are, there are people who are so wealthy and powerful that they want nothing to do with people who are below them and beneath them, so they just try to enjoy the blessing of God, the power of God, and the victory of God and want nothing to do with others. Which is this beautiful moment as a reminder that the Bible's written thousands of years ago and nothing's really changed, Right? Like when people get powerful, when they get wealthy, when they get status, they tend to avoid hard things in life and move on to the beautiful, spectacular things in life. That is a very natural thing. Let me say this. It is a natural thing for you to do to try to avoid messy, awkward people in your life. It is a natural, normal human thing to try to avoid hard situations in your life and just get to the good stuff. And Jesus is saying that's what everyone else does. But then I love what he says next, four words, verse 26, not so with you, not so with you. That's not the way it works if you call yourself a Christian. Being a Christian is not just about believing things. It's not just about coming to church and singing songs. It's not about just going to camp and doing things like that. It's about you having a fundamentally different view of how suffering fits into your life. It's about you saying, this person is messy, they are awkward, I don't like being around them, I'm uncomfortable, I'd rather just hang with my friends who are just like me. But rather than sidestep it and try to move on, for you to be a Christian is to say, you know what though, Jesus has put them in my life for a reason. I don't get that reason, I don't like that reason, I don't want that to be the case. But God is God and I am not and I'm going to love the person that Jesus has put in front of me. That's what it means to follow Jesus. What it means to follow Jesus is to recognize that he's in charge, and when he leads you into these types of people, listen, you just say, okay, I don't like this. It's not my favorite. It's not the best thing. They're in my small group, and they kind of annoy me, or they're kind of around the church, and they frustrate me, or they're this person that just really grates on me, but God's called me to love and serve them in this season. Jesus says, not so with you. You're going to operate in a different way. It continues on this way. It says, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must become your slave. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you want the cup of God's victory and goodness and blessing, if you want God's power in your life, if you want the amazing goodness of God's blessing, you're going to have to be a servant. You're going to have to serve people. And I don't just mean serve people you already like. I don't mean getting your best friend some food because you like hanging out with her. I mean that you serve the people you don't like. I mean that you love the people you'd rather not talk to. I mean you pray for the people who bother you. If you want to become great, you've got to become less. If you want to embrace less, you will be given more. This is the path of Jesus. It always begins with this and leads us into glory. That ultimately, if you want to be someone who calls yourself a Christian, you are going to have to embrace the title of servant. Servant. 
I serve people. I'm a servant. I'm not awesome. Jesus is awesome. I'm not a big deal. Jesus is a big deal. And in fact, I would say this. If you have no intention of embracing the title of servant, you have no intention of actually being a Christian. Like, hear me on that. If you don't want to be a servant, you don't want to be a Christian. And if you want to know, okay, am I a servant? Do I really have a servant's heart? Am I really like Jesus in this? Here's a great rubric for you. And we'll put this up on the screen here. You will know whether or not you have the heart of a servant by how you react and respond when you're treated like one. That's when you'll know. You will know whether or not you have the heart of a servant by how you react or how you respond when you're treated like one. Like in that moment where you are treated like a servant, your reaction tells you everything you need to know about whether or not you are a servant. So, so I, I was remembering this. I was a, a junior in high school. I'm 16 years old. It's a Thursday night. We got a Friday night football game. My team is doing a team dinner beforehand. We're all sitting down for food. We're eating. We're drinking. I get up to get a bottle of water. I pick up the bottle of water, and a friend of mine says, Brian, could you get me one? I said, absolutely. I go back to the table. I hand him a bottle of water, and someone else says, could I have a bottle of water too? I was like, absolutely. And so I gave him one, and then I went back to get another one, and then suddenly, like, everyone in the area started to know Brian's getting water, and so I found myself, like, just delivering water to people on my team, to everyone. It was, like, random passerbyers on the street are like, Brian, water. I'm like, here you go. Like, that was my life, and so I found myself just doing all of this, and I'm walking through that time, and I'm, I don't know how long it lasted. It was probably only a few minutes, but I just want to tell you about where my heart was at that point. I remember talking to my youth pastor about that later, my high school pastor, and just being like, I, I didn't like that situation. Because the truth is, I felt humiliated in that moment. I felt taken advantage of. I felt used. I felt like they weren't respecting me as like a starter on the football team. Like, I'm, a, I'm an awesome football player, but you were just using me as your little servant to go get water. I remember that moment because my mentor, my youth pastor, looked at me in that moment and said, okay, Brian, so, so what are you thinking about? I said, what do you want me to, what, what do I do next time? Like, next time people are like, give me a water, what do I do? Because I don't want to be taken advantage of. I don't want to be that person that people use. And I remember he looked at me and he said, Brian, here's what you should do next time. I said, what, what, what should I do? He goes, next time when they ask for a water, give them two waters. I was like, what? He goes, next time when they ask for a water, give them two waters. And see if anyone else wants a water. And continue to do that. I was like, but I'm being taken advantage of. He goes, that's fine. Continue to do that. Continue to be a servant. Because that's what it means to follow Jesus. See, in that moment, everything in my heart wanted to be more important than a servant. I'm not a water-getting servant. I don't get people bottles of water. I'm a big deal. I'm something else. But in that moment, I was challenged to remember that if you want to know whether you have the heart of a servant, you look at how you respond when you're treated like one. And that's what I want for you. I want for you to watch those moments where you're treated like a servant, where someone says, hey, do this, hey, look at this, where your parents say, hey, do the dishes, where that friend says, you know what, you plan it, you drive me, you do this thing. When you're treated in that way, I want you to watch the response of your heart because it will tell you everything you need to know about whether Jesus is shaping you to be more like him. Here's how we'll close. Our band's going to come up, and, and we'll close, as always, with a few songs, and, and we'll come before the Lord. But, but here's what I want to show you, this final verse. It says in verse 28, it says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus is referring to himself with this title, the Son of Man. It's one of the ways he referred to himself, that Jesus is the Son of God and he's the Son of Man, all in one person, all in one being. And Jesus says the Son of Man did not come to serve, or rather to be served, but to serve. Meaning God came in human flesh, not so that we could serve him, but he could serve us, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And I was thinking about this this week as I was um, taking care of my daughter. And, and, and so this has kind of been my week, right? Like, like everything about this girl is beautiful and wonderful and spectacular, and yet I just find that she is a factory, a never-ending, flowing river of needs, right? Like she's laying down and she's sleeping and she starts crying, so I pick her up, and I'm like, okay, you'll be okay. And then I'm like, okay, change your diaper. I change the diaper. Her. I pick her back up. I put her clothes on. Then I realize she needs food, and I'm, I'm not helpful in that arena. Um, so I hand her off to her mother, right? And her mother gets her food, and then we put her back down, and then we have to pick her back up a few minutes later. Like, that's the cycle. Over and over and over and over again, she has needs, and I meet them. She has needs, and I meet them. And here's what's crazy. In all of this time, I've never once considered not meeting those needs, not like I've never been like, oh, man, this is hard. But I've never thought to myself, like, you know what? She ate a few hours ago. Does she ever really need to eat again? Like, I've never thought that. 
I've never thought, like, I changed her diaper yesterday. Maybe she can just have the same diaper until she doesn't have diapers. Like, I've never thought that. I've never thought to myself, she's screaming, and we'll just let her scream until it's all over. Like, I've just never thought that to myself because, because, because. She's my daughter. Like, she's my kid. She's my child, and I'm her dad, and I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to stop meeting those needs. I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to say, you know what? You need to earn my love. You need to earn my, my desire to love you and help you. She's done nothing to earn it. She's just showed up. It's not like she's contributed. It's not like she's built something to, 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 to provide for our family. She's just been there. And because she's my child and because I'm her father, I continue to meet those needs. And I wonder if anyone in this room tonight needs to hear that you are a factory, a never-ending, flowing river of needs, and God continues to meet them. He continues to see you, and he meets them, not because you're awesome and not because you've earned it, but because you're his child and he loves you. Like, I wonder if some of you need to hear tonight that God's not sick of meeting your needs. God's not tired. God's not over you. God's not giving up on you. You have needs and God meets them. That's what he does because he's your father and you are his child. And ultimately, God saw your needs so much. He saw your deepest need. And that deepest need was the fact that you had unforgiven sin before God the Father that you have rebelled against the God of the universe, that you chose to go your own way and say, forget you, God, I don't want anything to do with you. But rather than punish you for your sin, rather than throw you in hell, rather than condemn you to a life away from him, God saw that and he sent Jesus to meet your deepest need. He sent Jesus so that he might be a ransom for many. And Jesus served you. Jesus served you by saying, I'll drink this cup the cup of your sin, the cup of the punishment that you deserve for what you've done, Jesus said, I'll drink it. I'll drink it so that I can serve them. I'll drink it so that I can love them. Ultimately, I'll drink it because Jesus drinks that cup. And on the cross, he suffers more than any sinner ever will in hell. Jesus absorbs the punishment of your sin and mine on that cross, and he dies. And they bury his body in the ground. But the good news of the gospel is because of what Jesus did with this cup, three days later, he rose from the dead and raised the cup of resurrection, of victory, of triumph, of power. Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of God, in all of God's glory, he receives and he drinks this cup. That forevermore, Jesus is the name we sing about, it's the name we talk about, it's the name that is above every other name. And if we are to call ourselves followers of Jesus, we follow the same path he did. That we say, Jesus, whatever you put in front of me, whoever you bring into my life, whatever you put into my path, I will drink that cup, Lord. Because you are God and I am not. Even when I don't understand it, even when I don't like it, even when I'd rather do something else, you are God and I am not. I will drink this cup because we believe that there will come a day, and that might be on this side of glory or the other, that you will raise the cup of resurrection and of glory, of God's blessing and his power and his goodness, and that for all of eternity we will sing about Jesus. The name is that above all other names. Oh, that you might be the type of people who would drink from the cup that Jesus has put in front of you now. And to do that with the expectation that one day you will rise in his victory. Let's pray. Um, Jesus, um, I'm just so moved right now at the fact that you are God and I'm not. Um, You are the one who is sovereign. You are the one who is holy. You put situations and people in my life. And God, even when I don't like that, I pray you would give me the courage and the faith and the trust to love them well. I pray that would be true of our church, true of our high school ministry. May we be people who drink the cup that you put in front of us, even when it's hard and uncomfortable, even when small group's difficult, even when our family's rough, even when things in our friendships are just so tense. God, I pray that you would give us the faith to trust you enough to drink from your cup, to know your love. God, make us servants, make us trusting uh, of you in every conceivable way. God, may it redound to your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen.